Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Musonda Mumba, and I am the director for the UNDP Rome Center for Sustainable Development. Welcome to Playfair, Turning Point Dialogues. Very excited to have such amazing and wonderful speakers today. And we're going to be talking about the big C word, climate change. Why does it matter? And why is this really huge threat to humanity, an important topic to really talk about. And I'm so excited to have such amazing speakers, two wonderful young ladies, one from one extreme part of the world, all the way in Toronto, Canada, and another one on the other side of the world in the Philippines, the land of the 7,000 islands. Welcome to both of you. Mitzi, I, I would love to start with you because you're in the Philippines, you are an accomplished climate justice um, advocate based in Metro Manila, and also you've been a convener and you remain an international spokesperson for youth advocates for climate change action. But what's even exciting, I understand, is that you are part of the Fridays for the Future. Um, of the Philippines and you've been very active, you've been really mobilizing and making sure that youth voices, young people, women, and also sort of different constituents come together and in particular indigenous peoples. So I really would love to, to hear from you because I, I, I'm, I've never been to the Philippines and I hear it's the land of 7,000 islands. And it's also been really fraught with many typhoons that hit the islands several times of the year. We are just inching towards COP26 in a few months. In your mind, what do you think is most needed for transformative changes as we go towards COP26, particularly um, working with indigenous peoples who are at the front line of fighting climate change? Thank you for that question. What we really need to remember is that the people who are most affected, the people who are most impacted are also the least responsible. So our indigenous peoples, our small farmers, our small fishing communities, um, the people from the global south, or as we like to call it in Fridays for Future, MAPA, are most affected peoples and areas. These are the people that need to be centered so that we veer away from that narrative that the climate crisis is a future problem, something to be afraid of in the future. Because while we think that it's a future problem, leaders will keep thinking that we still have time, that there's still a little bit of time left to keep emitting emissions. But the thing is, the climate crisis is here and already impacting people. And so we need to drastically cut emissions in the global north especially and they need to understand especially with cop coming up that climate action urgent climate action and um support for finance and and adapt adaptation and loss and damages this mm -hmm. isn't a nice thing to do is it isn't solidarity it isn't a duty or a noble responsibility it's a climate debt it is for reparations, for historical injustices of colonialism and neocolonialism, and for all the emissions they've admitted in the past. This is something that we have to remember. So we shift that narrative from the global South needing help and being poor and helpless into the global South needs reparation for the injustices done to them. Mm -hmm. So the need for reparations, we do not have time. And, and, and so how do we or how can we make better space, particularly for young people and also most affected to really be part of this decision making? We have to stop what we like to call now youth washing, where you have youth at an event, but then don't actually listen to them. We have to stop putting young people at the pedestal even and saying young people are the hope and the leaders, but it's not that. It's young people with the most marginalized groups of society. It, it can't just be young people anymore, one generation versus the other. It's not the adult generation that caused the climate crisis. It's the colonizers, it's the multinational companies, it's the fossil fuel industry. There is a specific part of the older generation that caused the climate crisis and it's not everyone. And it's definitely not the indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Wow, you know, it's the first time I've actually heard of the word youth washing. <laughs> 
Um, how interesting. Let's stop youth washing and putting young people um, on a pedal stool. Very exciting. I want to move to Kekashan. And, and, and Kekashan, before you start, I just want to introduce you because she's the founder and president of Green Hope Foundation and also United Nations Human Rights Champion. She happens to have been the winner of the 2016 International Children's Peace Prize. Congratulations. And she's also a global influencer, TEDx speaker, climate reality mentor, musician, lovely peace and sustainability campaigner, and was part of Forbes 30 Under 30. First ever winner of the Voices Youth Gobachev Schultz Legacy Award on your work on nuclear disarmament. Wow, this is impressive, Kikishan. Um, I'm so glad to have you both, and, and, and you really, your reputation precedes you. Um, you are not stranger to the UN conference and, and you know, these corridors where all these discussions and you're listening to, to, um, to Mitzi there and in terms of all these processes. What do you think is the most needed in terms of transformative changes in this critical year for climate? Thank you for the question. And, you know, I would say that what is re needed most right now for transformative change that really engages different communities and definitely us as young people is localized ground level action. And I say this with being involved with high level institutions such as the UN, because every single community, region, country faces different challenges. People have lived different lived experiences and our solutions have to reflect that. And we really need to do away with this one size fits all solution that is so often propagated by the media and especially the Western media. And this is something that you know affects youth even more because it causes us to be tokenized and stereotyped. And right now that's often just as climate strikers or protesters missing school when we really need to look beyond that because for the last 14 years I've been working with girls in climate disaster zones who don't have food to eat for whom education is a privilege how is she going to strike for climate is that going to put food on the table it's not but instead if you give her resilience education about her community's challenges both environmental and societal if you teach her how to grow crops about sustainable agriculture and poultry farming give her it education provide electricity from solar energy to her community provide clean water and sanitation all of which we are doing at green hope foundation just to give you a few examples, a change maker is created where she brings about change in her own zone of influence. And that creates a domino effect that inspires others around her to take action. And when this ground level work is replicated and adapted to the unique situations in different parts of the world, that brings about global change. And just to be a little more specific, the solar street lights and the solar panels that we've installed in a town in Liberia means that girls and women have safe spaces at night, they're able to go to school in the evening, and we're providing them with computer literacy education powered by solar energy that ensures they have economic stability and the proper skill sets to go out into the world and bring about change. And in another part of the world, by installing toilets in a village in Bangladesh, the girls finally feel safe going to school, and there we're teaching them about climate resilience and sustainable organic farming. So I feel through all of my work that this is climate justice, where we really look at the localized solutions and understand the unique lived experiences of every single person. No, thank you for that. And I mean, just listening to you today, I saw a tweet that said, gender justice and climate justice the place we want to be and you can see these two circles coming together and and thank you so much talking about education the lived experiences of many but also going away and moving away from this one size fits all and i think both of you are really just also talking about the time you know there is no time can we really act and do something um, for communities, but also really for young people. This is really exciting. So in your mind, how do we engage different communities and making sure that you know, there's an opportunity for inclusion, proper inclusion of young people? 
I would once again say that the best way to engage different communities is through the localized grand level action, which I do feel is young people. We have been uh, at the forefront of driving this change, not just now, but historically as well. And what I think is very important to remember is that partnerships are crucial, and that is why we need intergenerational solidarity, not alienating our elders, but working together. And I feel that the pandemic has really shown us how important multi-stakeholder dialogue is. So ensuring that governments, private sector, and civil society work hand in hand, where everyone has a seat at the table, both at the ground and at the highest levels of policymaking is paramount right now. And we at Green Hope Foundation work in 25 countries. So for us, this is something that we deal with every single day, but we have seen that once we listen to every single person, hear the stories from them and recognize that, recognize their lived experiences, and then the collaboration comes about. That is how we bring about global change that really includes everyone. Fantastic. I like the point on localized ground action and the intergenerational learning. I want to come back to you, Mitzi, really. So sort of if you can tell us, what would your call to action be for anybody out there who's listening and really intent on doing something to turn the tide, as it were? For people who want to turn their intentions into action, it starts with decentering yourselves and look where you can help support and empower others. Just like as Kekashan just mentioned, look around your local communities and look for the most marginalized people because there's usually already so much resistance there and help empower that and educate yourself by talking to them and learning from them because we have so, so much to learn from the people who are on the ground, from the grassroots, from the people who are most impacted by the climate crisis and least responsible. Fantastic. And also to you, Kekshan, what action do you think is important at the individual level? My call to action at an individual level would be to educate yourself and then educate your family, educate your community. And at Green Hope Foundation, we use education for sustainable development as our base of work. And we have seen time and time again that that ensures that children and young people and adults and all members of society as well have the empathy and the knowledge to bring about change. Once again, every community and region requires different solutions because the challenges are different. But what every single person can do is ensure that they have the knowledge to bring about change because without knowledge, you can't take action. So we have to understand that we learn every single day and we need to use that education now more than ever before to implement localized ground level action that leads to climate justice and even more so feminist climate justice. I like that, your end point on feminist climate justice. I also like the fact that, you know, you're talking about the power of empathy and both of you talking about education for sustainability. This is absolutely amazing. So we're now just coming to, um, to the final question. And, and I want to start with you, Mitzi. Um, Finally, you, you've both been sort of very climate conscientious and also really working towards having a climate conscientious uh, society, as it were. So can you tell us a little bit in terms of, you know, what inspired you to be where you are today? If somebody's listening to, you know, what, what would you love to share to make sure that we inspire someone out there to also be a change maker, to be the change they want to see? Mitzi. I became an activist when I was able to talk to an indigenous leader of our land and he told us about how they were being harassed and killed, displaced and militarized. This was back in 2017. Then ever so simply, he said, that's why we have no choice but to fight back. And it was so simple and it reminded me of my privilege to quote unquote, choose to be an activist when there are people who are pushed into activism because the consequences are way worse. And so, that is what inspires me because I, as I learned more and more about the environmental crisis and the climate crisis, I realized that he's right. We, none of us have a choice but to fight back at this point. And then I also remember that while I'm just joining the struggle of the environmental defenders who are already so strong, that's in my country. And then since I work regionally and in the global scale also, I'm exposed to the constant reminder that there's someone in every country 
fighting for the climate justice, fighting for the same thing that you are. And when you think of it like that, when you see how the youth climate movement continues to grow and learn and become more and more intersectional and unite with other sectors of society more, it's like nothing is impossible nothing is indeed is impossible you can be a change maker kekashan what inspires you and what inspired you to be where you are today what inspired me to start my climate justice journey well there are a few things the first thing that when i was seven i saw the image of a dead bird with its belly full of plastic and uh, that was deeply disturbing to me because it gave me sleepless nights and it really burst the bubble that I lived in because I grew up with empathy in my household, with seeing my parents and grandparents give back to the community and environment. But that image really made me realize that there was something very wrong with our world and how humanity was treating the world and that I had to do something to stop that from happening again. The second is that I, at the very same time, I attended a lecture by environmentalist Robert Swan and his words, something that I still stand by today, is that the greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. And that really has been uh, the foundation of the work that I've been doing for the last 14 years. And the third and last thing, something that you know has stuck with me my whole life is that I'm born on 5th June, that's World Environment Day. So I always felt that I was preordained to become an eco warrior, but what pushed me to take action was the dead bird and the quote by Robert Swan. What pushed me to start Green Hope Foundation when I was 12 is that I realized that there was a severe lack of inclusivity of children, especially in the sustainable development process. So taking my experience that I started when I was seven, I decided to involve other children and young people so that together we could bring about change. And now here we are to continue to work and that just moving forward towards that idea of a better today and a better tomorrow. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you very much for sharing that quote. Well, this is all we have time for. Thank you very much, Mitzi and Kekshan, and really great to have your insight on this. Thank you very much. And to everybody watching, have a beautiful day and be safe. Thank you.